And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Father Thomas McDermott, author of Catherine of Siena, Spiritual Development in Her Life and Teaching, published by Paulus Press. Welcome, Father, to EWTN's Thank you, Doug. Bookmark. Nice to be here. Uh, our audience may remember seeing you back uh, about six months or so, uh, back in the spring when you were actually on with Father Mitch, and you were on a special day. What day was that? That was the eve of the feast day of St. Catherine of Siena, which is on April the 29th. Right, and you also were at Mass that day as well. Right, on the 28th. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, on right. the feast day itself. Now, you're a Dominican. Catherine of Siena, some of our EWTN uh, viewers would know we did a series a number of years ago on Catherine mm -hmm. of Siena that we actually still offer through our religious catalog that Father Jacques Daly did. Now, Jacques Daly's not a Dominican. Mm -hmm. You're a Dominican. She's a Dominican, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And why is that an important connection? Isn't it, and why is she important to the Dominicans? Well, St. Catherine of Siena, in so many ways, was the epitome of what the Dominican order stands for. And it's paradoxical because normally Dominicans are associated with education right. and with being above average mm -hmm. in intelligence, if I may so, say so myself. St. Catherine was very intelligent. That part wasn't paradoxical. But she was illiterate. Mm -hmm. She didn't know how to read or write. Now, t possibly towards the end of her life, she developed some or was given some ability to do that by the Lord, but for most of her life she was an illiterate, and that makes her, I believe, the only illiterate mm -hmm. doctor of the church. Now that's not to say she wasn't intelligent, she right, was highly, right, exactly. highly intelligent. Well, she was born in what, 1347, so at that period of time it probably wouldn't have been unusual not for unusual many women at all. to, no. if not other people in general, to have not be that well Right, first, she was, right? She was a, a, a person of the people, she wasn't born of the nobility, and uh, ordinary women in those days did not receive that kind of education. So there was nothing unusual right. about that. Now, you know, I know when we first did our series on, on Catherine of Siena, and I really didn't know that much about uh -huh. her, and I should say I know more from reading your, 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 your uh -huh. book, uh, you, sh you look at her and she looks like a religious sister, but she wasn't, right? She wasn't really, no. She was, in Europe at that time, there was a movement which has since been called the movement of pen penitential women women who associated themselves with the major, major religious orders of the day and lived a kind of modified spirituality for lay people mm -hmm. and dressed in modified religious habits. In the case of Catherine of Siena, the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and these groups developed into, some of them into what we call today third orders. Mm -hmm. And uh, Catherine associated herself with a group of widows, although she wasn't one, she was very young at the time, mm -hmm at the Dominican Church in Siena, which was just up the hill from her house. Right, but she had taken a vow of virginity, right? She was never going to, now she was never going to get married. As a, as a little she, she girl, was 16 when or she something. was, yeah, very young, I think six or seven even, oh, okay. she took a, a private vow of virginity, which okay. she didn't tell anybody about. But later she received a modified Dominican habit and so she was officially associated with the Dominican order, but she was not a nun. Right. And she did not live in a convent. She had nothing against that. Mm -hmm. Actually, the only religious vocation open to women in those days was to be a cloistered, contemplative nun. Okay. Catherine had nothing against that vocation. She sent many young women mm -hmm. to the cloister, and she herself started um, a Dominican monastery of nuns right outside of Siena at a certain point. The ruins of it are still there, but that wasn't her vocation. Right, okay. So she had what we'd say as an active order today. That's right. right. Okay. Now, and, and as you correctly indicated, it was she was about seven when she made that vow. Mm -hmm. I guess it was later on maybe she made a public uh, announcement because she had some concern that her parents were trying to marry her off, right? Right, right. Okay. But also, she was six years old when she had her first vision. Mm hmm. Right. She was coming home from her sister's house. She was a little girl, like you said, six or seven years old. Her older brother, by just a couple of years, was ahead of her on this path. They were coming down the hill towards their house. The path is still there. It's marked where she had this religious experience. Mm -hmm. And she saw this beautiful image of Christ dressed in, in, in papal uh, vestments with a tiara above the Dominican church. Mm -hmm. And there was no message. Uh, there was no locution, as we would say, but it was an, an extremely uh, profound religious experience for the child. And whatever it was, it was beautiful for her. I mean, she found it very, very attractive. And it's interesting, later on in her teachings about uh, God, she refers to him so often as supreme beauty. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, being a, a person from medieval uh, Siena, she probably was very sensitive to beauty. Mm -hmm. And she saw God and frequently called him supreme beauty. Right. And you write in the book here uh, about her vision. Within it was the Savior of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ, seated on a lordly throne, clothed in pontifical vestments and wearing on his head a tiara, the regal mitre of the Pope, with him were the princes of the apostles, Peter and Paul, and blessed John the Evangelist. So mm -hmm. That's kind of the image. Now, what's interesting with this book, and, and I guess to be clear with everybody, is this isn't a biography in the sense of no, going through no. the life and adventures mm -hmm. of St. Catherine of mm -hmm. Siena. This is really more focused on her spiritual journey, That's right? right, her spiritual journey and her spiritual teaching. And that's what I think makes the book unusual, mm -hmm. is that uh, she is a doctor of the church, but if you ask many people, what is her doctrine? What is her spiritual teaching? Probably they're not going to be able to tell you. Mm -hmm. And that's because not much has been written on it. Uh, very, very few people, practically no one that I know of in English, has attempted to look at the whole of her teaching, which would involve reading uh, the book mm -hmm. that Catherine wrote uh, through dictation called The Dialogue of St. Catherine of Siena. And her 381 letters, which are all quite lengthy. All of them have recently been translated into English. And then we have 26 prayers of her that were taken down by secretaries when she was in a mystical state. You have to look at all of those writings mm -hmm. to be able to uh, look, you know, arrive at some clarity as to what she was talking about. But actually, it's very simple, her doctrine, and it's mm -hmm. very rich. And I want to get the word out there that uh, it's a, a fascinating teaching that St. Catherine had. And here she was a fascinating personality, a beautiful mm -hmm. personality. Uh, John Paul II referred to her as uh, one of the great examples in history of grace building on nature, St. Thomas Aquinas's aphorism, beautiful aphorism, very Catholic, grace builds on nature. Mm -hmm. That grace took nothing whatsoever away from St. Catherine that was of value, but it in a sense enriched her humanity and made her to be the beautiful, attractive personality that she was to others. Mm -hmm. You said uh, in the in the forward that was written by a father, you can pronounce it. Uh, Wojciech Giertyk. Okay, thank you, Father. Pronouncing. He says, the gifts of the Holy Spirit alighten her soul would inspire her to speak about the Christian life and renewal of the church. And he talks about the eye of intellect and goes on to say, the colorful images that Catherine used in rapid succession to explain the mysteries of faith without great concern for their inner coherence can be baffling. Uh -huh. And you say, have often been perplexed, people have been, per by the confusion and inconsistencies of our imagery and says there's a mistaken expectation in a sense that there's a theological system to be found. So uh -huh. on one level in reading through the book, you get this idea that it's, it's fairly accessible for people because she uh -huh. doesn't, it's not heavy, th it's, it, it are these images and mm -hmm. analogies that she uses, but mm -hmm. at the same time, He's saying it's disconcerting. How do you put those two together? Well, that's a very good point, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Father Wojtek Giertyk, incidentally, is the papal theologian uh, for, the, uh, for the pontiff. Um, St. Catherine of Siena was not, strictly speaking, a theologian. She was a mystic, mm -hmm. and by mystic, I mean someone who had personally encountered the Lord. And all of the truths of the faith to her mm -hmm were uh, transformative. There was no such thing as neutral revelation. So she meditated deeply and assimilated these truths into her own life. And then because she was a member of the Order of Preachers, she felt um, greatly compelled to um, disseminate this, to make the good news known to other people. And she was always uh, groping for new and better images in order to explain the truth. For example, the Incarnation, when God became man. Uh, one of the images that she used that people would have understood very well back then is that God is like a, a housewife who needs his divinity, like he's making, he's kneading dough okay, okay. to make bread. Like kneading something, but actually yeah, physically. Yeah, K-N-E-A-D, right, right. needs his divinity into the dough of our humanity. Well, that's what Italian women would do back then. They would knead dough, pasta, mm -hmm. to make what we call pasta today. Mm -hmm. Uh, she had many different images for the soul. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, if you have a kind of Germanic mindset, which uh, many of us Americans and others do, you know, you want to make connections, you want clear definitions, but the definitions keep shifting. Mm -hmm. But it's not really difficult. And I think the advantage of my book here is it's, it's kind of a, a simple road map mm -hmm. through a lot of her terminology. 
Right, another one I noticed, was the, the steps leading across the bridge that is Christ. Mm -hmm. That's a very important part of her uh, teaching, Doug, in the dialogue. And the dialogue, incidentally, is Catherine asks four questions of the Lord, and the Lord answers, and the answers are the book. Mm -hmm. And the, she entrusted the book. Uh, it came into existence about three years before the and end the of her life. And the book meaning the dialogues The dialogue of St. Catherine of Siena. Because she called it the book. Right, right. and right. she entrusted it to her friend and her confessor, Blessed Raymond of Capua, who went on to become the Master General of the Dominican Order. But in this beautiful book, which is really a compendium of her mature spiritual thought, um, the central portion of it, and the one that really got my attention when I first read it several years ago, is the teaching on the bridge of Christ crucified where the Eternal Father, God the Father, says to Catherine that he made of his son a bridge stretching from heaven to earth so that man and God could meet again. Mm -hmm. And Catherine embellished this idea of the bridge, saying that it was um, the crucified Christ and that the first stop on the bridge was at the feet of Christ and then the open side of Christ where we could look in and see the secret of the heart and then finally to the lips of Christ where we experience the kiss of peace. And um, it becomes quite an involved teaching, but a very practical teaching too. And she says, you know, at the feet of Christ, we don't really love God yet. We're, we're there because we're afraid. We're going to God because we're afraid. What are we afraid of? We're afraid of his punishments. Mm -hmm. We need to go higher. And she, she says that emanating from the top of this bridge, from the head of Christ, is love. And the inspiration for that was Christ's own words, that when I am lifted up, I will draw all things to myself. So the draw of love, the heart is drawn by love, she says. And if you respond to that love with more knowledge and, and, and more love, then you'll ascend higher mm -hmm. to the secret of the heart, to the open wound of Christ, and you'll be transformed gradually into a mercenary servant, a person who does the right thing as far as God is concerned, but actually loves God's gifts mm -hmm. And ultimately Hence loves the himself. Attitude. Yeah, get, there's a payment there, right? And doesn't really love God yet, mm -hmm. but he's meant to continue to respond to the call of love, and to become a friend and eventually a child of God who just loves God for their own sake. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of Catherine's uh, repeated teachings, and this is very Dominican, is that uh, love follows knowledge. Mm -hmm. That when you know God you're going to love him automatically. And more correct or true knowledge results in, in more love. But also, conversely, defective knowledge results in defective love, not only of God, but also of yourself and of others. Mm -hmm. One of the mottos, the chief motto of the Dominican order is that of truth, veritas. And she hammers away at this concept of truth. The tr getting to know the truth about ourselves and the truth about God. Those are the two most important things we should know in life. Mm -hmm. Today, do you think that's a big problem we have is this kind of lack of understanding of truth or a defective understanding of truth which causes us some problems in, Very much so. in knowing God and, and loving God the way we should? Very much. I, you know, our culture is in many ways, I think, tinged by nihilism. Mm -hmm. We despair of, of truth of the existence of truth. It's not a matter of not finding it. It's a matter of it not existing in the first place. Everything is relative. And because we don't know mm -hmm. the fundamental truth about ourselves, that we are made in the image and the likeness of God, but that we are wounded, mm -hmm. not entirely corrupted, by sin, that our, our, our knowledge of the truth is uh, darkened. Mm -hmm. Catherine says, though in baptism we receive a kind of torch, and the torch illumines things so that we can see more of the truth. But of course, it's only in the next life, in eternity, that we'll have actual pure vision of it. Now, Catherine gives out these images, but uh -huh. did she see these images in her dialogues, like the way St. Faustina saw, you know, uh -huh. the image uh, of Divine Mercy? Oh, she did. She did, yeah. Now, we wouldn't know that. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't know about her interior life if Raymond of Capua, who was her papally appointed confessor, mm -hmm. and eventually soon on became her friend and her disciple even, hadn't commanded her to tell him about her spiritual journey. And that resulted in a book uh, called The Life of St. Catherine of Siena, written by Blessed Raymond of Capua. It's readily available. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So she shares with him under obedience mm -hmm. uh, all of the occurrences in her uh, 
um, spiritual life. She had, she had many unusual spiritual experiences, including the stigmata. Right. But there's one thing I like. But it was like an invisible stigmata. It was an invisible it? stigmata, and she requested that it be invisible because she didn't want that attention, you know, drawn to herself. And, uh, and she saw the stigmata as having some bearing on, a, on the broadening of her apostolate, that now her love for others was going to be a crucified love, such as what Christ had. Now, in, in, in reading through, uh, you talk about uh, hagiography, which is kind of like the kind of the talking about the lives of the saints mm -hmm. now. Some of this talks about a lot of uh, was levitation, was that mm -hmm. one of the ones? Right. And these kind of things. And in our 20th century mindset, wasn't there some maybe askance looked at this sometime later of questioning how much of what was written actually occurred as opposed mm -hmm. to the kind of thing I think you, as they say in, you say in the book, was what was expected to be written about a person who was clearly a saint. Right, right. Well, hagiography um, kind of has a, a bad rep, I would say, nowadays. And it's sometimes taken to be a kind of um, uh, false literature written by members of religious orders to get their own deceased members canonized. Mm -hmm. And so the truth was manipulated. Now, I'm sure in the long course of 2,000 years that, that probably happened quite a few times, but the, um, the life of St. Catherine that Blessed Raymond of Capua wrote uh, is, I really believe, good hagiography. And Father Conleth Kearns, who uh, did his own tra translation of the work too, recognized that there was something very unusual about this work. Mm -hmm. And let me just give you one example of that. At the sure. end of every chapter, Blessed Raymond would say, now my sources, for this are her mother who is still living. Or my source was also her sister-in-law, uh, so-and-so. Or I was an eyewitness to this, as he was at the stigmata. Mm -hmm. He also says in another part in his work, now I don't remember exactly everything she says, because it was many years ago, but I'm going to give you the sense of it. Mm -hmm. And at times I even feel that Catherine is whispering in my ear to recall those things that she said. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an unusual, for medieval times, I think it's an unusual piece of, um, of literature. Right, and also you note that uh, a careful reading of the sources reveals some hints of Catherine's more ordinary side, you say. Um, also worthy of note is her unwillingness to come out of the cell to help her neighbor. The time mm -hmm. she hid on the roof of her house to avoid helping a small child she thought uh -huh. possessed. Uh, go on to say, additionally, her very practical knowledge of life in all facets suggests that Catherine had more life experience than the biographical accounts indicate, because the impression was that uh, maybe she had never committed a mortal sin. Or right, that, you know. mm -hmm. and I think if she had been ordered to write her autobiography, which mm -hmm. she wasn't, right. she would have highlighted all those right. things about how far she had come and how far she still had yet to go. But I do want to say, Doug, that you know she was an amazingly beautiful personality. We think of mystics as being cold and aloof, but here was a woman who people simply enjoyed being around. Right. And many people who came with depression or some other problem, they left even laughing after being in her presence. They were so happy. Now, it was in 1970 when uh, Pope Paul VI actually uh, made her a doctor of the church along with Teresa of Avila, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I believe you all. And uh, those were the first two women right. named uh -huh. doctors uh, and at the time. And I would think, just thinking about what you said, that there's a contrast even there between those two personalities, mm -hmm. right? There is, you know, and uh, I would say my second most favorite saint or mystic is St. Teresa of Avila. Mm -hmm. Now, St. Catherine lived about, what, 300 years before. Mm -hmm. And I'll say this much about St. Catherine. Is she's very rich, and uh, I'm, it's not fair to compare the two. But Catherine is in some ways closer to Scripture mm -hmm. than St. Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross were, who were much more interested in psychological states and their description. Catherine didn't bother with that. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't talk about any of that in the dialogue. And I think this is one reason, her closeness to Scripture or the Gospel, why Protestants traditionally have been very, very interested in St. Catherine, although she's very strong in the papacy. She cannot imagine... Well, she was involved with getting the Pope to come back from Avignon right, right, to uh, right. Rome. Right. And uh, she called the Pope the sweet Christ on earth. So I cannot envision... I'm sure she couldn't envision a Christianity w without a head, you know, a church mm -hmm. without a head. But having said that, her extreme kind of uh, Romanism, if mm -hmm. I can call it that, she's very popular with mm -hmm. Protestants mm -hmm. because she talks a lot about the cross 
She, she deals with the basics mm -hmm. of the Christian faith, mm -hmm. the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, she died when she was 33. Yes, uh-huh. Do you think that has meaning? Oh, I think it does, because um, she, I think, I think those who were closest to her saw her as another Christ. And there is a story how one day some of her followers were there and they saw her face transformed into the face of a bearded man like uh, Jesus Christ or even God the Father. But I believe her own self-perception was somewhere between Mary Magdalene and the Apostle Paul. She was very enamored with Paul and his self-forgetfulness and his uh, absolutely being on fire for the mission. Now, in the forward there, I noticed that uh, there was also this reference I thought was interesting because obviously you've got the Dominican, the great Dominican, Thomas Aquinas, and we talked about the whole theological system versus uh -huh. kind of Catherine's approach. But growth and sanctity is not a technique that can be learned by training. I'm just going to ask you, is that something mm -hmm. we get caught up today in? Mm -hmm. And nor is it true that having attained a certain stage, one can only proceed forward, never falling back. Was that the case with Catherine? That she never fell back? Mm -hmm. No, she never did fall back. You know, she kept on responding to that sensation of love from the cross. And I believe this is one of her great teachings, that if you're going to do theology, if you like that expression or accept it, that the only way to do it is um, out of a love union with Christ. And that theology, just like the revelation of truth by God, is, is meant to be life-giving. Mm -hmm. And so she would be very much in support of the movement today back to a contemplative theology such as we had it during the days of the lives of, of the great fathers of the church. Mm -hmm. She would be very much in agreement with uh, von Balthasar, for example, the great theologian who said that we should do theology on our knees mm -hmm. so that if you don't love and know Jesus Christ, you, your, your teaching, your knowledge mm -hmm. is going to be defective. It's not just to... And it's not a matter of rational knowledge, but to be in communion also with the Lord Jesus. This is one of her great messages, I think, as a doctor of the church. Well, later on in the book, you say, Catherine undoubtedly is one of the greatest examples in the history of the church of someone who, quote-unquote, let Christ enter fully into her life and who, far from being, quote-unquote, diminished and deprived, became free, beautiful, and great. You go on to talk about the idea of, in short, becoming fully human. Is that the mm -hmm. important message for our audience today? Well, I think, yes, it is, that of her life, that uh, this is a way to be fully human. People, uh, Raymond records how many times there'd be more than a thousand people around her trying to see her, and that they regarded her words and her teachings as marvelous. Mm -hmm. So they came to hear her and to see her. So she had some sort of personal charisma that's clearly... She had, evident from because she what did she had the brigade of forty or what, what was that group she that had disciples yeah the Bella Brigata or the right. little family which is another uh, uh, interesting fact about her that I think speaks volumes about the kind of attractive personality mm -hmm. she had that so many young people and she herself was rather young wanted to be with mm -hmm. her and around her and these were people who were educated who in almost every instance were drawn from the nobility and they included priests and not just Dominican priests but their Augustinians and Franciscans. Right. Now one of the things we certainly on EWTN have tried to promote is is the great statements of the saints and kind of uh, the, the what they believed and how they believed it through the age and how it impacts us today. Mm -hmm. If St. Catherine came back today, mm -hmm. how would she relate to today's situation in the church. Mm -hmm. Well, she lived very, during a very, very trying time in, in history and in church history. By the time she died, there were two popes, one legitimate, one the anti-pope, uh, Clement VII. And, um, and many saints were confused mm -hmm. as to which, you know, was the legitimate pope. Catherine wasn't confused. For her, it was simple. It was uh, Urban VI. Uh, aside from that, there was a lot of moral depravity in the clergy. Mm -hmm. She talks about that in a very hard-hitting way in the dialogue. Very, very uh, sharp words. She loved the clergy. She loved the priesthood because they were conduits of the blood of Jesus Christ. But if you weren't living up to your vocation, she let you have it. Mm -hmm. And she did believe, of course, in forgiveness. Um, it would be unthinkable to St. Catherine of Siena to, de to defect from the church because the church is the body of Christ. 
And uh, perhaps she would say that just as in the Apostolic College you had some who defected, mm -hmm. or one who defected in the lifetime of Jesus, that um, it's natural to right. think that this is going to happen again. And also, to go one step further, she would see herself as part of the problem, mm -hmm. you know, as a sinner. Mm -hmm. So she wouldn't, say, she wouldn't point fingers at right. others and say, you messed up, right. I've made things difficult for me, but it's my own lack of conversion that um, along with yours, this, this right. you know, uh, that has converted, uh, you know, resulted in this problem. Right, just before we go, how long did it actually take you to write this book? Uh, two years, about eight hours every day, and incidentally, I had permission to live in Italy. I wrote this book about 50 yards, I suppose, from the tomb of St. Catherine of Siena. I lived in a, at Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome, right. which is a great privilege. Did you ever feel like she was whispering in your ear? I felt that I, I really knew her mm -hmm. at the end of this exercise. I mean, I'd spent so much time reading, and I thought, you know, am I going to read something someday that she wrote that's really going to disappoint me right. and, and kind of put the brakes on this project? And I never did. Never did. And just uh -uh. before we go, any other books in the works? Uh, I'm planning to do a little book on, uh, on, the, on spiritual theology in general. Okay, great. Great. Well, thank you so much for stopping by, Father. Thanks, Keep Doug. Good I appreciate work. it. Good to thank see you. Thank you very much. Father Thomas McDermott, author of Catherine of Siena, Spiritual Development in Her Life and Teaching, and it's published by Paulus Press, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Check it out. Check us out next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.